One of the big planetary science highlights this year is the much anticipated DART mission, which launched in November 2021 and is due to impact the tiny moonlit Dimorphos orbiting the asteroid Didymos on September 26, 2022. Joining me today to talk about this mission is Jan Yang Li, a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute, who is also a DART investigation team member, leading the Hubble Space Telescope observations of the DART impact ejecta. Welcome, Jan Yang, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So tell us about the DART mission. What is it and why are we doing it? Okay, so um, DART mission is the first um, NASA planetary defense test mission. So the goal is to hit a, uh, the secondary body of a, plan a binary asteroid system. Mm -hmm. And the purpose is to change its orbit a tiny bit. And for that, with that, we will be able to test how much we can um, you know, change the orbit of an asteroid if it's in a collision course to the Earth. So in the future, we'll have a much, much better idea you know, what, how we can do it and how well we can do it and how well we can protect planet Earth. So that's so planet. So planet. planetary defense, of course, is important because, well, we have no dinosaurs anymore and we know that the dinosaurs are wiped out by an asteroid. We'd like that to not happen to us. So that's what the goal here is, is to find a possible method for saving humanity, essentially. Yes, exactly. You know, um, the impact of asteroids to Earth actually happens every day. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, most of these impacts are blocked by our thick atmosphere. So most of the impacts are burned out in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But it is, you know, if it's big enough, then it will, um, um, you know, have some impact to us. Like, you know, we all remember the Chelyabinsk, um, um, you know, fireball event, and that got many, many people hurt. We don't right. want that to happen. <laughs> And if it's even larger, then it, it may hit the earth and make a crater and then create more disaster. And we certainly don't want that to happen. So this is you know, one step, one small step towards um, you know, mitigating that kind of hazard. So is, Di is, is Didymos, is, is Dimorphos, are these a threat to earth? Are these potentially uh, dangerous asteroids for earth? Um, they are in, um, they're in a close, uh, they orbit very close to the Earth. I can't remember whether their orbit crosses the Earth, um, but they are definitely no danger to Earth as we know now. So um, there's definitely no danger, um, and uh, we don't know. We actually don't know any of other, um, you know, asteroids that's going to impact Earth in the, in the, you know, in the in the future that, as we know for, so far. So right. We have no We've. We've talked about it on the show, how headlines like to tell us that Apophis is going to uh, impact Earth, but it's, you know, not predicted for like 200 years or something at this exactly. point. And every time we take a measurement, it gets a little bit better for us. Uh, so what is going to happen with the mission on the 26th? What are we looking for? What is what is the process that day? OK, so um, the DART spacecraft is going to you know, in, uh, it's going to impact the uh, Dimorphos in the mm -hmm. final time, final minute. And then um, I think six hours before the impact, that's where we call um, it's the final um, terminal phase, maybe mm -hmm. four hours. Uh, and then at that time, the, the um, spacecraft will switch to autonomous navigation. So it will, you know, find the target in its camera mm -hmm. and um, guide itself to hit into the into the secondary body, and this is actually a little bit complicated case because now we have two blobs in the field of view. So the spacecraft is trained to you know know that we're gonna impact the smaller one, not the bigger one, and it's gonna guide itself you know just directly hit into um, Dimorphos, um, hopefully in the middle, but you know, and that's at least that's the plan. Um, and then so, go ahead. Yes. Oh, so I was just gonna say that's gonna be uh, that's gonna that's what's gonna happen on that day, and we're gonna all be watching the event because the spacecraft is going to, you know, the space spacecraft is going to destroy itself after the impact. So um, all the data it collected, it it collects on the way in will have to be played back to Earth before it before it's dead. So um, it will stream back the data as it approaches, 
and we will, you know, receive the data as it approaches, approaches, and you know, uh, approaches dimorphous. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna see the images. See the target gets closer and closer, gets bigger and bigger, and then suddenly it's gone. So, so it's very exciting. I, I'm really excited by the real time, real time streaming of the data. That is that is really exciting, and I'm looking forward to following along with that. Um, how are you since the since the spacecraft is essentially destroying itself here? How are you going to measure any of the results that happen from this impact? Any change to Dimorphos's orbit? Okay, so um, I actually forgot to mention that there's another um, small spacecraft, a CubeSat, that's tagged along with DART. Um, actually, it was just separated from the DART spacecraft a few days ago, very successfully. And uh, it that spacecraft is called Nietzsche Cube. It's provided by the Italian Space Agency. Mm-hmm. So that spacecraft is going to survive. It's going to divert its course a little bit and then fly by the target. Um, it's going to fly by a few minutes um, after the impact. So it will watch the, the impact itself, watch the development of the, of the ejector. And then, you know, as it zip, zip by uh, Dimorphos. So that's the first hand images. Well, um, in addition to the, to the images returned by the DART spacecraft. So those will be the images, first-hand images of the ejector, of the impact of the ejector mm-hmm. in the early stage. And then uh, after that, we have a lot of uh, ground-based facilities that's going to be looking at um, Didymos at that time and afterwards. And uh, we have, uh, you know, telescopes almost cover all the longitude on the Earth. And we also have a Hubble Space Telescope. We have JWST, James Webb te- Space Telescope. They are all going to be looking at um, the, the system. First, look at the ejector, and then for a long time, maybe for several months following the impact, all the ground, many many ground space, ground based space, uh, ground based telescopes are going to look at the Dimorphos and see the uh, its light, the change in its um, you know its brightness, and that's a signature of the period, of mm-hmm. you know the uh, um, how fast Dimorphos Dimorphos circle uh, Didymos. And then from that, we're gonna measure the period of the of the, of the rotation. I mean, not the rotation, I'm sorry. We're gonna measure the period of the dimorphous as it, as it goes around uh, Didymos. So um, we're going to compare that period and see how much we change the period through the impact. And what's the, what's the expectation on how much you're gonna change that period? I, I'm assuming we're not talking, we're not, we're not winging it out from orbit from from Didymos. We're just altering its orbit around Didymos. So what kind of exactly? What kind of change are we looking for here? Um, so we are looking for a change of the orbital period of at least seventy seconds out of uh, eleven point nine hours of the orbital period. So that's a okay. tiny change. Yeah. Um, but we will we will be able to measure it from the ground. And uh, so, the orbital period is going to be the largest change. And we expect there will be some other small changes, maybe in the orbital plane and in how the orbital oscillates. Um, but those are going to be tiny. Mm-hmm. The main effect is the period of change. How long is it going to take before we know what, how much of an effect we, that we've, we've made on this? What's the time frame for how long these measurements are going to take? Well, I think the team is um, um, going is planning for a quick release of the results for the impact, um, mm-hmm. maybe a couple of days after afterwards. You know, this is all uh, the decision made by NASA, so uh, this is their plan. And uh, so those will be the you know the the quick results. We're gonna see whether we we hit it and how much mm-hmm. uh, ejector we created. And but for the period change, we're gonna have to wait um, for maybe I would say a month or maybe two months. Okay. Because um, you know, people on the ground on the teles- at the telescopes, they will take time to measure. They will have to wait first uh, for the eject to dissipate, mm. so they can accurately measure the brightness of Didymos mm. and measure this brightness change. The brightness change is very tiny; it's like less than one percent. So you have to wait until all the ejector particles are gone, and then it goes back to its pre pre impact brightness. Then they can measure the tiny change. So. Um, I would say maybe a month or two, there will be some first result, you know, first round of results coming out in, in terms of the orbital change. 
Now you're leading the Hubble telescope observations. What are you, what is your team going to be looking for? You're measuring the ejecta obviously, so that's part of the brightness, but what specifically is Hubble gonna be able to detect with this? Um, the, the real advantage of Hubble is it's very high spatial resolution. So that means we can basically look at very, 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 very tiny features mm -hmm. and we can resolve it. So, um, um, and also it's in space, so it doesn't matter the weather. We can right. basically look at it whenever um, Hubble is coming, Hubble comes out from the back of the earth. You know, the earth is blocking our way for half of its orbit, right? So uh, basically there's very little time constraint. So um, Hubble is going to look at, you know, take images, take pictures of the ejecta as it, you know, um, comes out and then grow bigger and bigger and then dissipate. We're going to um, look at Hubble continuously for the first nine hours after the impact. And then uh, after that, we're going to look at it once every half day for like three days, and then once every day for another three days, then once a week until three weeks after the impact. So we're gonna look, we're gonna uh, look at the the, the whole um, evolutionary state, whole evolutionary sequence of the ejector, and you know with very high resolution. So how how much data do you think that just your Hubble observations are is going to create? Um, we're gonna create like you know not many many images compared to uh, like many space missions which produce like terabytes of images. Um, I think we're gonna produce like maybe around hundreds of images. Mm -hmm. um, so not many, but it's a very, you know, it has it's, it has very high resolution. That's not cannot be done from the ground at all. Right. So I think maybe, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, re resolved, spatially resolved images of the ejector, those will only come from Hubble, from JWST, and maybe from VLT, very large telescope of, uh, mm. you know, in Chile. Um, so yeah, those are only those are the only images that gonna have the um, ejector. We're gonna have we're gonna see how the ejector looks like. Mm -hmm. For other um, data from the ground, it only be it only will only be the brightness of the of the ejector because they cannot resolve it. What is your team doing in preparation for the impact? Oh, um, earlier we're doing predictions. Although the predictions have very large error, you know, we have if we have good predictions, we'll be able to better set, you know, set good exposure time, you know, mm -hmm. select the aperture, how big of the field of view we want to include in our observations. So, you know, earlier stage where we were doing like modeling predictions, uh, but it's very hard to predict. So we have a very large uncertainty in the in the sequence. I mean in the model. And then based on that model, we are, you know. In the past month, actually, I was working with Space Space Telescope in Science Institute, mm -hmm. try to define our observing sequence, and that is a uh, it's 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 really a difficult process because uh, you know Didymos is very close to the Earth and uh, Hubble is moving around the Earth, so um uh, you know the uh, the the apparent motion of Didymos in sky is kind of kind of complicated. And Hubble has to track the target accurately, and that's what I would have been. We have, what we have been doing in the past month. So yeah. you're, you said these these aren't very big. I mean, obviously, uh, Dimorphos is not very big. It's it's a basically a moonlet of of Didymos. How big is Didymos? How big <clears throat> is Dimorphos? Didymos has a diameter of um, seven hundred eighty meters, and the Dimorphos is um, 160 meters in diameter, and their separation is like 1.2 kilometers. Oh, wow. Um, so very close to each other, very small, and even Hubble cannot resolve these two apart. So there will be, there will both appear in one single pixel, even seen from Hubble. Oh, wow. WSD. So how are you going to resolve all the ejecta? Is it just the change in brightness, but you're, or, you know, what, how is this going to work? Ejecta is going to be big because we know we because these two have very tiny gravity. Mm -hmm. So most of the ejecta cloud, most of the ejecta we created, they will just go 
you know, dissipate. They will just leave the system, leave the Marvels, leave the Demos uh, forever. So they're gonna, you know, expand. The cloud will, will, will expand with time. Um, so they, you know, the cloud could be like hundreds or thousand kilometers or even larger. That's how, you know, we can resolve them. They're much bigger than the system itself. So are you involved in, in planetary defense in general or just this project specifically? Uh, this is my first planetary defense involvement. So I'm, you know, most interested in uh, uh, the ejector development, you know, the, the ejector particle, you know, like particle size and ejector um, speed and uh, mm. how much ejector we created, you know, things like those. From so the science, are you science point of view? What are what are you looking forward to with this? What's what's really got you excited about the Dart mission? Oh, um, I guess the really exciting part is the is the um, you know real time broadcast of the images from the mm -hmm. system when we approach and before we impact, and that's like first time we had this thing. You know, previously, many years ago, we had deep impact. That's that that impacted the, a comet, and mm -hmm. but you know that one it flies by um, the, uh, the the impact and it had a many uh, had a lot of time to radio back the images. But this one you have to radio back radio it back very fast, and the uh, camera takes images um, I think once every second. So it's like take a, take a video as you slam into the into the asteroid. That's that's and really uh will the public be able to watch this or is this just for um, the science team nasa has a live event at that time um but i don't know the detail of their plan whether they're gonna you know show the images one by one frame by frame as like what we see or mm -hmm. you know they do something else i i don't really know the detail but you know i really hope they will do this kind of a, a live broadcast <laughs> of slabbing into an asteroid that's where will you be when this is going on? Um, I think I'm going to be just stay in my office. Uh, but mo many of my colleagues are going to um, APL, you know, the, the, like the, the control center of the mission. And uh, you know, just witness the time and the exciting time and uh, celebrate. Well, it, it sounds really exciting and I'm really excited for you and I'm really excited for this mission. I want to see how this turns out. Planetary defense, of course, is incredibly important. Again, the dinosaurs didn't have a planetary defense program. And uh, so <laughs> after DART, what what are do you have your next project in line? Is it, Do you know what you're going to be working on after that? Oh, um, I'm always working on series. You know uh the the biggest asteroid series or rock mm -hmm. planet series it was a target of dawn mission and it has been really really interesting because um i think you know um it has a lot of water water in it and it may have um, um cryo cryovolcanic in his in its history there are a lot of evidence on series about cryo cryovolcanic activity on series and it may has a it has some liquid oceans underneath, just like uh, the outer solar system, icy, icy planets. So, um, you know, people are imagining that they might have some in, in some implications about astrobiology. And uh, it's really interesting. What's for you, what's been the most interesting uh, revelation about Ceres that you've found out since the Dawn mission? Uh, well, personally, I actually studied Sirius for a really long time. I, uh, you know, my PhD thesis has a part about Sirius. That was uh, the Hubble, you know, an analysis of Hubble images of Sirius. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, it, you know, it has a, some personal connection to it, right from the start of my research from my career. <laughs> so, uh, but in, scientifically, I think, um, you know, Sirius is really, uh, really uh, interesting object, and uh, before. Dawn mission actually changed our view of Ceres fundamentally. Before that, we thought, okay, it's just another asteroid, although it's the mm -hmm. biggest, and uh, it may have more water than other asteroids, but you know, it's just there. But afterwards, we thought after Dawn, we realized that it's actually similar to outer solar system icy bodies. So you know, it's um, um, it's very close to us compared to Jupiter, 
sunlight and sudden sunlight. It's easy to get there. And also we have uh, um, a whole mission worth of data to study it now. So. And, and so we're still processing all of that data from Dawn, right? There's not, it's not yes. finished yet. The mission itself is no. finished, but the data is still being analyzed. Yeah, exactly. Tons of data. <laughs> all right. Well, <laughs> once again, thank you for speaking with me today, Chan Young. Um, good luck with those post impact measurements. And uh, thank you. Thank you again. Now is Thank going you. to be the time when we uh, we turn to Eric Mattis and the rocket launches from the last week, including that one that failed perfectly. Stay tuned. <laughs>